morning. Good morning. I'm Lori Gordon. I'd like to welcome all of you from near and far to what I know is going to be a very exciting, stimulating weekend workshop. I first came across Virginia Satir's work right after Conjoint Family Therapy was published in 1964. So that's just about 20 years ago, and it lit up the sky for me. It was the first book I read that made sense in terms of understanding people and what went wrong in relationships and what I could do to help. And from that time on, it has enriched my practice and became the core of the PEARS course that started about seven years ago after teaching at American University, a course that included a lot of Virginia's work. And the graduate students started coming to me at the end of the course and said, you know, this really made a difference in my life. And I began thinking, why, get it, why don't I teach this to couples who come to my institute, the Family Relations Institute, which was started in the late 1960s. If we can teach this to graduate students, why can't we teach it on a preventive maintenance basis? And so in approximately 1978, I and some colleagues started developing the PEAR Seminar, which is now a four-month seminar for couples in any stage of a relationship who want to understand themselves better, each other better, and improve their relationship. The course is one night a week and one weekend a month for four months. Heavy commitment. And a lot of the course is the work that Virginia in person is going to be presenting to you this weekend. So I consider that we are very fortunate to have her. Uh, I'm very excited about sharing this opportunity with all of you to learn from the master. I told a story briefly last night at the lecture that Virginia gave that in Japan, they name certain people who are known for their unique talent and wisdom, national living treasures. And for me, and I'm sure for all of you, if not now, by the end of this four days, you will know why we consider Virginia our national living treasure. And may she live for at least 50 more years and continue to enrich all of us with her work. I always look around, see what goodies are in the audience. <laughs> you ever think of yourself as a goodie? One of those rare birds that's rare? How many of you make your living by therapizing people? <laughs> okay. You know, it's going to take off 30 years of your life when you start thinking that, you're, that you are going to be with rare individuals. I don't know how many of you have gotten there yet. That was a turning point for me. I could leave the psychiatric nomenclature. I could leave all those categories. And I could begin to explore the uniqueness of individuals. And that's when health came. So we got a lot of work to do. I don't know how many of you at this point in time know that the minute we start to categorize people, we've, we've lost them. We've lost them. So what are we going to do? with all that fine information that we got. Well, we can play with it in games, but we don't use it with people in the way we've been using it. And yet, I belong to a vintage. I got my first degree in 1936, and the next one in 1943. And in those days, the definition of being a professional was how you could call people names. And that meant you were professional. That was all that special language that you could write down on a piece of paper, and we called it diagnosis. I have to tell you a story about that. It's a story that haunts me and will haunt me to the rest of my days. In my eagerness to be a professional, to be a good professional, I learned all of the things I was supposed to learn. One of the things that I learned is that when I met people for therapeutic reasons, I needed to observe certain things. And all these things that I was supposed to observe then got translated into a category. Well, this woman came in and I observed. I had a piece of paper under my big blotter 
about the things I was supposed to observe. I would look down periodically to see if I was observing them. And I would write down certain things when she wasn't looking. <laughs> and uh, when the interview was over, I, I looked at all of them and then I went to a book and I took all of these observations and I said, what does that mean? And that meant manic depression. So then the next thing was I had learned how to, I mean, I thought I learned how to treat, quote, manic depressives. So here I was with my observations translated into a category and then I treated my category. This woman, while I loved her and while there was lots of love going on and all that stuff, I never really found her. And she ended up with 11 years in a mental hospital and died there. It was a tragedy, a tragedy at that time, which I was very confident and am, still am, I know, in my field at that time. But I was using tools that could not be helpful. And that has haunted me. It's not very much different from the woman or the man who raised a family at a time when it was you fed your kid every four hours, whether they wanted it or not, uh, this kind of structured kind of work. And then later on, you would see the effects of that. This was not because I was perverse. I was only ignorant. And I have a whole slew of people now I know that are just as ignorant as I was at that time and doing the same horrible things. And I have to tell you something else. Now, after over almost 50 years in the field, and what I see and have seen as the outcome, which is so skinny compared to the energy that's put in by helping people, that I understand now, and I feel sad about it. You know there is no reason on this earth why we need to have repeaters on public welfare, that we need to have the state of affairs that we have with older people, or younger people. There is no reason for that except that we haven't known how to help well. And that isn't because we are stupid or because we are uh, perverse. It's because we haven't known something very important. When we see Jane Addams knew something that a lot of us forgot for a while when we became fancy, Jane Addams would go in and you know there are many people in the world. It is a result of her work with them which was all totally one and the same, was building their self-esteem. And many people, famous architects and artists and lawyers throughout the world, when she went into the place, the little neighborhood centers and into the homes, and that's what she did was to bring out the self-worth and become famous in relation to the finding of the self-worth instead of the categorizing. So one of the things now for me I never want anybody to feel bad about where they come from, where they come from in their families, where they come from in their professions. But what I would like is for people to begin to open their eyes about what is helping, because I think we can do better than what we're doing. I think that people are not as hard to work with as we used to think. They're only hard to work with when we decide how they should be and then try to make them that way. I'll never forget in a mental hospital at one point, after a successful time with a young woman, she said to me at the end, you know, Virginia, what's the real trouble? People in your profession decide how we should be and then treat us as though we were that way, so we have no chance. So in a way, I am certain that those of you who are here also have been making steps into thinking about using yourself professionally in a different way than what many of you were taught. We are not in that tight psychoanalytic hang-up that we have been, that we were in 40 years ago. What we're going toward, however, in the family therapy field is another tight hang-up about who's right. Have you noticed that? <laughs> Instead of seeing the Rashomon part, which is, you know, how many of you remember the movie Rashomon? Well, just for those who haven't, Rashomon was a marvelous Japanese movie. There was, there was something that took place, an event, and six people saw the event. And the rest of the movie is about each person's perception and experience with that event. And it was as different as day is from night. So what I have always hailed is everybody's picture, but let us never get into the position of saying whose picture is right. 
all of the children, all of us who, we were all, we were all children, take three children grown up in the same family and they can report different kinds of parents, even though they were the same one. And so this beautiful thing about everything is unique uh, to each of us. Each experience is unique. There's nothing that says that I can find that any experience will be, or any event will be experienced in the same way by more than one person. And this is an important thing to remember. Anyhow, I, uh, I, maybe it's a function of my age uh, and what I've done in the world, but at this point in time, for me, the journey is a sacred one. I didn't used to talk this way, but for me to work with somebody for those people to allow me to become intimate in their lives, which is what you have to do as a therapist, the most intimate details is a sacred trust. So therefore, I cannot abuse it. I cannot, I cannot reject it. I, I treat it as a manifestation of life in which Perhaps some things have been closed off. Now, I want to do something and find out something. First of all, I want to find out how it is, if I'm down here, what that does to the people in the back. Can you still see all right? It better? It's better for me. I just want to know if we can see all right. What about you in the back? Okay? So we may later on get a bigger thing up here. This is too small for any real work anyway. Now, okay. Now I'd like to find out, first of all, something. How many of you in this room think that you know everyone in this room? <clears throat> Would it be a safe assumption that there are people in this room who do not know each other? You think that'd be safe? No. Okay. I think it's very safe, but I don't want to make a mistake, so I check out. How many of you were aware that families can live together and don't know each other? How many of you know that? But we assume that because people do live together that they know each other. Of course, I hope that's the last thing now that you will assume until you check out. All right, now let's uh, change the, the assumption. No, not change the assumption. Let's change this condition that has come about for the factual part that you all don't know each other. So how are we going to do that? Well, I have an idea. The idea is that now will come all these unique beings that are in here, each one of you with your own lights and all that, and you will take that beautiful self of yours, come Jesse, beautiful self of yours, and you will bring it to its feet, like this one. Why don't you stand up here, Jesse? And um, you see, my, sometimes when I do this, there are a lot of people who start shrinking inside <laughs> because they've been told all their lives that they shouldn't be out front. That's for somebody else. Or somebody would think there was something selfish about it, or they were showing off, or something like that. Anyway, but today, that which would have been negative before now is an essential to your being. So here we are. You just turn around, Jesse, if you don't mind. Now, you, you don't have to do all this turning around, but what am I doing here? I am saying to Jesse and asking her to say to herself that she is an important, beautiful being, unique. Okay? doesn't mean she does everything right. That's another thing. <laughs> that does not get mixed up, our basic beauty, with our behavior. Because um, later on, when we really know our basic beauty, our behavior will change. But many of us don't know that. All right. Then, having done that, she's in a position to call herself a treasure. Lori called me one. I could call her one. We could call ourselves one, a treasure, the like of which does not exist anywhere except here. Each one's is different. So she says to herself, I am of value. I'm the only one exactly like me. And you know how hard we work and what respect we give to rarity. So if you're the only one of your kind, then you are as rare as could be. And what is due you by yourself and by others is all of the things that we do to protect the rarity. A rarity. So, all right, now we're there. So now, here you are in yourself, a rare bird. 
right. You're going to meet another one. And as you do, as rarity meets rarity, now we'll see, we'll have a, would you be a companion here now? Thank you very much. I was lucky to know uh, Jesse's name, but I haven't yet known yours. What Marianne. Is it? Marianne. Marianne, would you stand up here now? All right. Now, have you, uh, did you know before this minute, Mar did you know Marianne? No. Had you ever looked at her? No. Okay, and you know, you, she was sitting there and you were sitting here. You know, they were just sitting an aisle across from each other. Now, think how many times in the world we're that close to somebody and don't even see them. Okay? Right? All right. That's neither good nor bad. It's simply a fact. Okay. Now, now you know that Marianne's in the world, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, Marianne, did you know up until this minute that Jesse was in the world? I caught her and you know, looked at her. Good. You caught her and looked at her. Wait, where is my... Uh, oh, here it is. Just a minute. I don't want these pearls to go unheard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now say what you said again, Marianne. I sort of caught sight of her and looked at her a bit. I see. Okay. So you were noticing Jessie, but Jessie didn't know, notice you, and she didn't know you were noticing her. <laughs> These, this will lead somewhere. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right. Now, there were, that, she was in your awareness, and Marianne, uh, Jessie was in your awareness, Marianne, but Marianne was not in your awareness. But now, you're very much in each other's awareness, aren't you? Mm -hmm. How do you suppose that happened? It's your fault. <laughs> it's my fault, okay. It's my fault. Tell me how it's my fault. You drew my attention to her. You, you drew my attention, okay. Have you ever had the experience of having your attention drawn to something and I wasn't there to do it? Yes. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> So we're talking now about something that how we can, one way in which we expand our sense of our world is something asks us to pay attention to something that's present, but we hadn't noticed it before. Think about that for a minute. That's the basic part of growth. That something that is already present that we haven't noticed now gets noticed. And I'll just invite you for a minute to just ask yourself about every single human being has all kinds of things about them that they haven't noticed. You have it about yourself. I have it about myself. Lots of things I haven't noticed. Some of the things that I have and you have that I haven't noticed are part of my riches and some of them are part of my pain. So now to call attention to Something that is present, but not yet noticed, is a fundamental facet of my work with people. To call attention to what is present, but not yet, but not yet acknowledged or noticed. Now, and to do it in a way which makes things rich. We're on our way to riches between Mary Ann and Jesse at this point. Not in terms of, and I'll tell you how it could have been. I could have, here's Jesse sitting here and Marianne sitting over there. And I could have handled this in such a way when Jesse said, when I said to Jesse, did you know that Marianne was in the world? She'd say, no. And I'd say, well, you were sitting right across from her. I don't know how you could have missed her. <laughs> what do you suppose that would have done with something that was present but not acknowledged? Yes, of course. It's a, it's a way to say, for God's sakes, you're bad or shut up. And yet, this is a way that many people try to bring an awareness. I say, well, it's right there in front of your nose. <laughs> or suppose that when Marianne said that she'd noticed Jesse, uh, and I could have said to Jesse at that point, well, after all, you know, how could you be sitting there without knowing that somebody would notice you? Couldn't you feel that? What I'm talking about right now is a way of noticing. This second way that I'm talking about doesn't do very much with anybody except squash them. And I have heard with my own ears 
people, therapists, teachers, parents, trying to bring attention to a student, to a client, patient, or a child through this method. Uh, well, anybody can see that. And they don't know that they are putting another piece of horror into that person's self about their unacceptability. <coughs> okay, anyway, I just wanted to put that out, all right? Everything we need, I know, is all present. We just haven't noticed it. Okay, now here are these two beauties. Remember where we started. We, we started off with the assumption, and then we, I, I started with the assumption that you all didn't know each other, but I wanted to make it, see if it was really true, found out that it was true you didn't all know each other. Now I'm in the process of seeing about how we can change that. So this long roundabout way is like putting something under a microscope and looking at it. Two unique beings, all we've really done has been to just notice both of them and add each one to notice each other, okay? All right, now, when you meet, they already had their hands together. That was something I didn't say, you know, and they did it. And because they did it is a comment on that's a natural thing we want to do with people. Have you noticed that? It, the natural thing you want to do with people is to connect with them. How easily your hands can slip to the hand of another one if you allow yourself to do it. If you allow yourself to do it. All right, okay. Now you're meeting. So now let us now meet. Treasures meeting treasures. So here you are about to have the greatest adventure in the world, meeting another treasure and you meeting a treasure, a great, greatest adventure. So would you do it so that what we do in, in life mostly is we extend a hand. So let's do the handshake first of all. Now let's do a different kind of handshake. See, handshakes are okay all over the world. I've tried it. <laughs> They're all over the world okay. Never mind what the books say. All right, now, so now you've got your hand together there. Now what, was, what they're doing right now is they're not just having one hand, they're having two hands. Very nice, okay? Are you, are, are you feeling each other's skin? Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Now when you have a hand in your hand, you not only have a form, but you have flesh and you have warmth and you have activity because in this hand, are all kinds of activities going on. Blood is running through and there are nerve endings and there are muscles and all kinds of things. This is an alive piece of you. So you feel that aliveness with each other, all right? Skins meeting skins, aliveness meeting aliveness. And the thrill and the safety of being in touch with another skin that says to you, we belong together in this world. Think a minute. Let's suppose he's, this is a black skin and this is a red skin, let's say. The skin color doesn't change anything about the feeling. Nothing. Nothing. But in our minds it sometimes does. Okay, all right, so there you are, you made your handshake. Now I'd like you to make your contact with your eyes. But keep the hands together, that's a fine thing. Now, if you were to speak, you would get another connection, which would be through your voice tone. Um, let's play a little bit here for a minute. Let's make believe, Jesse, that while you're going through all this, basically underneath you think, I'm not such a treasure. Virginia's just making that up, because really, I'm not so much, okay? Do you ever hear anybody inside with those kinds of ideas? Even if it's you, maybe it was you. All right, so you think that, and now when you say hello to her, you say hello to her that reflects you're not very much. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Hardly so it could be noticed. All right, now we come to something else. Her voice tone, Jesse's voice tone, your voice tone, my voice tone, reflects me and where I am with myself. And so, when I change with where I am with myself, my voice changes. Okay. All right. So now, at this moment in time, that is not the case, because you are thinking, isn't it great that I am here, and Marianne is here, and we are meeting? Now, when you say hi to her, let's hear your voice tone. 
Hi, Marianne. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and it happened so quickly that uh, it's really something. All right, now, I want you all to meet people. You're getting your beautiful self up there. Would you want to hold this? Both of you, however you want to do it. Get your beautiful self up there and go on this treasure hunt. Now, not like this, then I know you wouldn't do it, but I want to show you the, the way in which many people do this. How do you do? How are you? I'm glad to see you. Yes, yes, I'm glad to see you. Oh, good morning. Yeah. That's the politician's handshake. It covers ground, but it never lights anywhere. Or the receiving line. You know that old story about the receiving line? About there was this fancy party, and here were all these fancy ladies with all their dresses. And so some character of a guy, he went along and he said, um, as he would say hello to everybody, shake their hand, he said, you look awful, you look awful, you look awful. And they all smiled and said, thank you very much. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that, was, that had nothing to do with anybody. Nobody was listening. So what I'd like you to do now is to get that beautiful self up. You are a treasure, meeting other treasures, looking, uh, speaking, and touching each other. So go and see who you all got here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, there's a very important lesson in that. Now, how many of you feel that on, on one or more levels, you have extended what you could say <coughs> is I know more people here? How many can do that now? Okay, all right. Now, I gather that it would still be true that you have not yet encountered everybody here, <laughs> but maybe the feeling is that now you are more a part of this group. How many of you feel a change in how you feel being here now? All right, now, suppose, suppose I had said to you, I'll get up here for a while now, Suppose I said to you, now listen, we're a professional group. And what I want you to do is go around and look at all these people and see what you can find about what's wrong with people. <laughs> I can guarantee you, and you know it, even without my, do, my having to have you experience it, you would not feel as you're feeling right now. You would feel like this. Now think for a moment what it would be like if as we pursued our career of change artists, that where we started was as I started with you. Families, groups, even if you were working individually. That you were there to have the treasures come together. And if you were to think that the work that you were going to do was to help this treasure manifest as a treasure. Think about that. See, most of the time, as I've seen it in the past, and maybe I think it's getting better, is that when we are helpers, we start out with being with problems instead of with the people that are there. And so at this moment in time, there's a whole different feel. We could handle much more now because our energies feel that are ava more available to handling whatever comes up, the questions or the concerns or whatever it is, because we come from a richer place. I don't know when I discovered that, but it was some time ago. Because always people who came to me, they would say, I don't know how you do it, but I always feel so good. And somehow, I always feel I've got more than I ever thought I had. And I used to search around for what could be that. Well, how, why was that so? Doesn't everybody have that? Then I realized that I approach people from the standpoint of helping them to experience what they have. And I really spend very little time except at the beginning, maybe, or what's your problem? I, that's really of very little interest to me. What's your problem? What for me is a big interest is what happened to your dreams? 
where are you with what you hope for for yourself? And what I find is the problem is the answer to my dreams have died, myself is not of value, and so we have the problem of not doing well in school, of drinking, of taking drugs, of aggression, all that, all come back to that. And that, of course, is a self-worth issue. So if I want to help people, I want to help them go to the highest level of their self-worth, their treasurehood, really and truly. Anyway, all right, now, so now what we have is we have turned on the energy that ordinarily would be kept toward keeping people safe. Now we have it for our use. Because if you wiggled a little with the person sitting beside of you, not would, you probably would enjoy it. <laughs> right? Okay. All right. Now, let us now take a look at within this frame. We're going to be here four days. The first two days, um, just looking at all of the parts of whatever we want to look at. And the last two days to apply this in real life. Of course, we're doing real life all the time. But there's a special application to real life. So what I'd like to find out from you is, what would you like to have happen? Now we're into the second phase of this, which is to build the uh, structure of what I'm going to call the loom for the tapestry that, I, that we all are going to work together. Let me speak about that for a minute. For me, tapestry is a weaving. And it's always unique. Because the people that are doing it, and the issues that are involved and so on, are all unique to a particular group. Every interview I've ever done was a tapestry in and of itself. So if you can imagine that here, there is a loom already set up, a large loom, a loom that's large enough to accommodate a big tapestry or a small tapestry. And let us say that the Warp threads and the woof threads have all been threaded on this, on this loom for whatever design we want to put in there. And that this loom and all of these threads are like the grid of the concepts and awarenesses that I use to be helpful to people. And you will be learning those things. However, where you are and the particular ways in which you would like to see that or the particular application or whatever it is becomes the design. In other words, in an oversimplified way, here is the loom and here are the, here are the threads. And this is already here. These represent the concepts, the ways of approach and so on like I told you about. Now what we put on here will represent what it is that we need and it fits this particular group in terms of what is needed. So if you can think that every day you have a different tapestry of your life, if you approach it that way, every time you come together with a per person or a group, the tapestry is different. And the effect of the tapestry, or I should say the way a tapestry can come out in its design depends upon what are the if I approach people with what's wrong with them, and that's the basis of my loom, which is what most therapeutic therapy is all about, theory is all about, then my design is going to reflect all the problems that are there. And they'll be in terrible colors for the most part, and won't be a very interesting design from my point of view. So this, all of these, this grid that I have here are really the ways that we uh, approach things we have in our mind, what we intend to perceive, and so on. So here now is the time to find out what you would like to have happen for you. That's my way of saying, what do you want to put into the tapestry? That's the same thing if I were interviewing a family. I'd say, what do you want to have happen? That's usually my first question after we connect and so on and so forth, like I did here. What do you want to have happen? What do you want out of this? Of course, when I say that, people then, of course, tell me, they usually start telling me what they don't have, and I say, yes, I understand that now, but what do you want out of this? Have you ever had anybody call you up, a woman, for instance, call you up and say, um, my husband's alcoholic and I'd like to come in? I say, what for? 
<laughs> because I want to, him to stop drinking. I said, well, it's his mouth we'll have to deal with, not yours. But I can deal with you and how you deal with him. But I can't deal with him without you. Without him, rather. All right, anyway. So now's the time to take a look at what you would like to have happen as a result of coming here for these four days. What do you want for yourself? So let's take a look at that. Because this is, out of this, we will weave our tapestry. What would you like to have happen? Now, that's a very stunning question. Because every time I ask it, I almost always <clears throat> get a silence. And what I make of that silence is that we are so used to asking the questions about, or answering the ones about what should we want, or what, uh, what is the right thing, instead of that beautiful thing, what do I want for me? It's the hardest question to answer in the world. Have you ever thought about that? What do I want to have happen for me? Come. Come on up here with me, please, sir. <clears throat> What's that? I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. I guess I wanted that, too. Well, then you got it, didn't you? Yeah, good, good. All right. And say your name, because now what we have is a beautiful opportunity to begin to see all the uniquenesses of the, of the people that are here. So would you like to share with your name? Thank you, Morris. So that all your goodies can be heard. I'm Lewis Morgan, a pastoral counselor with the Washington Pastoral Counseling Service here in D.C. What I would like to have happen to me while I'm with you, I told you a while ago I had the privilege, by the way, of getting acquainted with her uh, while we were doing our getting acquainted a while ago, and I was commenting to her that uh, I was with you in a workshop about 12 years ago, I think, over at the University of Maryland. You have been, or your approach has been my favorite approach in marital and family therapy. I've tried to use it a lot. You mentioned a while ago the large uh, number of competing systems or procedures and models. What I would like to have happen to me is that as you go through this weekend, there would be a recognition on my part of how the model of this theory or the model of that theory how you tie it all in together. I believe that you do tie it all in together. And somehow, if I can feel under the general loom of your approach, how I'm touching base with all these other models, it will be very helpful to me. That's lovely. Is there anyone else in Lewis's place where you'd like to kind of see what kind of sense do the Rashomans all make? <laughs> and are they really, uh, what, what, how do we look at it? <laughs> I think it's a splendid thing, and one of the things I want to do in the near future is write about that. Write about that. Just don't wait. Don't wait. I won't wait too long. Thanks, Lewis. Okay, what about somebody else? Come. <clears throat> and you are? I'm Nancy Nimick. Nancy. Okay, Nancy. Um, I know that what I want more is Let, let's find out something and yeah. see if everybody's hearing you. Are you all hearing, Nancy? Yes. Not yet. All right. So, Nancy, uh, let's How's this? It. Is this better? Uh, I want to um, learn to experience my own treasureness uh, in working with couples. And huh. that's as general and, and as specific as I can make it. All right. Nancy has articulated something. While I'm working, I want to feel like a treasure. I'm going to ask you to finish this sentence and see what comes out. Instead of a... <laughs> Incompetent, uh, insecure, I really don't have anything to give. I'm really bungling this. Oh, I could go on for quite okay, some all right. time. <laughs> How many of you... <laughs> How many of you know something about what Nancy's saying? Let's see. Marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. Thank you, my love. You're welcome. By the way, that little dialogue that Nancy put out, you know, I probably don't have anything to offer, and who am I to blah, blah, blah. Anybody recognize that kind of dialogue as an early dialogue when you were a kid? 
that you heard around you? Mostly that's what it's about. And we forgot to update ourselves. And when we get into our treasure hood, the updating comes. <clears throat> Trouble with most of us is that we were born little. <laughs> <laughs> See, and in that state of affairs, if we don't have some people around us to lead us to the fact that we are special, really special right from the beginning, these old things continue. Well, let's see who else we have here. Come. Hello. Hi there, and you are? I'm Trish. Trish, and would you now give all your energy to that? Because you remember what happened with Nancy. Mm -hmm. OK, I'll try. Um, this is about my fifth experience with Virginia. And I've taken in so much uh, of you as a model unconsciously and have been resistant to a number of skills that I've taken the risk to learn, um, one of which we talked about a long time ago was NLP and hypnosis. And I discovered that it was useful and that I wanted to now with that unconscious learning, watch you again and <laughs> reinforce it all. So I'm here to absorb more of you as a new model. OK, let me, let me tell you something I heard. Let's see if that was at all in your awareness when you okay. said it. That once upon a time, <clears throat> you um, thought that everything you did was conscious. <laughs> I don't think I really thought that, but I didn't know how I managed to do the things I did. OK. And I'm giving a lot of credit to my unconscious abilities okay. and supporting them a little bit more. OK, let me put in then a little correction. Once upon a time, <laughs> right. You thought that all you had to depend on was your conscious, and then you saw things happen which your conscious didn't have anything to do with. I didn't have anything to do with that. It happened. Uh -huh. And how did it happen? And then as you, you didn't push it away, and you began to see that there were things that were present, but you hadn't noticed. Like, how do we take in through a voice tone? Mm -hmm. How do we take in through skin? How do we, how do we activate? that beautiful reservoir we have in ourselves that's connected with the right brain in hunches and metaphors and all of this kind of stuff. And then you got something out there that allowed you to start to talk about it. Things that Erickson talked about in hypnosis and the NLP people evolved out of the stuff that I was doing. Mm -hmm. And um, then you began to see there was another whole place out there. Well, it was sort of the framework for the loom. I already had a tapestry, but I didn't know, I didn't trust no. that the loom would stay together. No, no. You don't know what's behind it, and you right. only look at the, at the design. You don't know what's going to keep it together. Right. That's the source of, oh my god, I'll fall apart. <laughs> because here you are, or I am, I don't do this too much anymore, but I'm afraid I'm going to fall apart, and I don't realize that I've got a great structure there. i got feet and arms and a body, and I can breathe. And I can think, and I can feel, and I can see, and I can hear. And when I got all that, whatever design I'm doing at a moment in time, I can trust it. Right. That's what you found out. Yeah. Great. And I'm here again. Isn't that marvelous? How many of you can identify with what Trish is talking about? Let's see. Learning about what's present, but not manifest, but being used. I will tell you, if any of you are social workers here, I think that's what they try to get at called rapport. You know, I, I, I never could figure out what that was. I was always supposed to have it, but what was it? <laughs> or you had it and you didn't know what it was. Yeah, well, I knew all kinds of marvelous things were happening, but right. you know, when you write examinations, what's rapport? I don't know. <laughs> now I know a little bit about it. It's the flow. Mm -hmm. It's the flow where we're really touching one sacred being to another. That's really what it is. OK, thanks, Trish. Thank you. All right, let's hear about somebody else. Come. 
Yes, you want to tell everybody who you are? Oh, who I am? Yes, oh. what is your name, that is. You don't have to do all the other details. <laughs> uh, my name is Beth Miller, and uh, I'm Lori Gordon's daughter. Um, what I'd like to get out of being here is I'd like to find a way to go after my dreams without hurting other people. Question mark. What's in the question? Did you hear your voice go up, question mark? Did you hear that? So I know this isn't completed. Because what I hear in the end of this is something like, is that possible, Virginia? Can I give myself permission to do that? What is the question? You would like to go after your dreams without hurting other people, question mark. So what's the question that follows? I gave you what I thought it might be, but what's yours? My question is, is it possible to live my life taking risks and bring other people that care about me into that without that being threatening to them? And it hasn't seemed to be like that. Who decides, Beth, uh, who decides how one is threatened? You mean, are, do they decide for themselves? Isn't that true? Asking? Yeah, but I feel responsible for that. Do you, anyone know this dialogue? <laughs> <laughs> In a bigger scale, it means I'm responsible for everything. And whatever happens to you, it's my fault. Now, where are you? No, like, it's not my fault. That's <laughs> great. Well, you see, whatever I give to somebody, they have to deal with. Now, yeah. I can have some uh, choices in what I deal with. If I hand somebody a cleaver, um, they have to deal with that. They have to decide whether they'll take it or not. Then they have to, then suppose I say, when I hand them the cleaver, go cut off somebody's head. They have to deal with that. But they don't have to take the cleaver in the first place. But there's a whole business in relation to all of this, which has hung us all up for years. And it goes something like this, that I'm responsible for everything, and you don't have anything to say. You just have to bear whatever I give you. Now, what about children? All right, what about children? Um, seems to me children don't have that choice. They're That's real right. Little That's children. exactly right. Little children don't have that choice. <laughs> So then you need to take into consideration what you're going to do. And that's where I feel responsible. Okay, now you see, we've got a nice global thing going here. There are all kinds of ways that people handle that. There's also a price that everybody pays. We live in a world where we move. Every time I take this piece, come here. Every time that I move my foot here, I got my foot here and you can't have it because my foot is in that space. So I have my foot here. You can't have your foot here. But neither can I have my foot where your foot is. Now, if you want to have your foot where my foot is at this moment in time, we have all kinds of ways of dealing with that. You can say to me, Virginia, I would like to have my foot where your foot is. Then I can say, well, if I move my foot over here, that will give you a place for it. I can do that. Mm -hmm. You can say to me when my foot is here, how dare you put your foot where my foot wants to be? And I can say, well, what business is it of yours? All right, in which case you can say, I'll show you. I'll get my gang to fit you, fix you up. <laughs> or you can say to me, you can start to cry. And you can say, if you loved me, you wouldn't have put your foot where I wanted to have mine. Okay. Now, we'll be going into all of this in terms of life is a risk. And the, the ones, and when it comes to dealing with children, small children, we in our own maturity have choices to make. There are different choices than when we're not mature. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay. Thank you. That's a big question. Thank you, Beth. How many can identify with that thing about what, what, what cost do you think goes on because you want to have your dreams? 
What I found in families is everybody can help everybody else with their dreams, then everybody wins. But if it's one person against the rest, then usually the cost is heavy. <coughs> Most of the things that are positive, the cost is only maintenance, how to keep it going. Usually isn't much more than that. All right, let's hear from somebody else. Come. Peter, right? Yep. All right, Peter. Um, I'm Peter, as Virginia said. I know I'm going to gain a lot of things professionally from this, but um, the thing I thought about, which nobody's mentioned so far, is that I would like to learn um, why I seem to be so frightened to open my heart fully to my wife and uh, why it seems to be impossible to really meet her and keep my freedom, my sense of myself. I have floods of metaphors and, uh, and one of them is, and this is not an answer, it's just only something to look at. If you were to give your heart fully to your wife, would she give it back? I guess I'm scared she wouldn't. <laughs> okay. okay. If you gave, and maybe you needed, felt you needed to, that heart to your mother and she didn't give it back? Okay. So this is your wife you're dealing with, but the long experience with your mother is somewhere there. And that, of course, has something to do with, mm. with how your mother feared for you especially in relation to your father. Can you all see those connections? Okay. So this beautiful one here forgot, and it's easy to forget, that his wife is not his mother. <laughs> but that's, those are some words, but they're beginnings. And he has a long history in feeling that he wanted to be sure that his mother didn't feel so afraid. How many of you know as kids that you were very sensitive to not wanting your parents to be embarrassed, to not wanting them to be more afraid than what they were, that you knew that? How many of you know that? Let's see that. Of course, all kids know that. But the parents don't see that. And many a kid, in fact, that's what I found out in childhood schizophrenia, that a child, and it can happen very soon after birth, does not this is a way of sacrificing so the parents won't be too upset. I found that a long time ago. But since the kids can't say it, they, the parents never discover it. Most symptoms in children are sacrifices for the parents, only they don't know it. Good. How do you feel right now? A little trembly. <laughs> is that a, how, and how does that trembly feeling feel for you? Um, it feels okay. Okay, because you know, trembliness is kind of like that. Then however your head calls it is whether you get scared or excited. And what Fritz Perls used to say is breathe a little when you feel that way and it'll probably always turn to excitement. <laughs> okay, thank Good. you, Peter. All right, let's hear from somebody else. Come. Thank you, I saw your hand just now. Yes. I'm Gloria. I think I want some more permission areas. Good. Now, let's stop for a minute and let's ask a very interesting question. At least I think it's interesting. I know that it's true, but why is it we need permission? We somehow do, mm -hmm. but why do you think we do? Not sure. Hmm? Not sure. I think it's for approval in a way. Approval. It's okay, but we're coming along just fine because yeah. here you are, a grown up, beautiful woman. <clears throat> I'm sure a great brain, all oh, kinds of experience. <laughs> and then you say, you say, I need permission. And I know this is so. I know this is so. Then you follow it up. Someone said something about not being sure. And you followed it up with some kind of approval. All right. My hunch about all this is, is that when we were little, it goes right back to that. When we were little, we had so much of the feeling that we shouldn't take steps, which I think is in your case, until Mama said it was okay. Well, mine, mine came because I took them 
And they said, no, it was not okay. All right, okay, <laughs> and that's the same thing. Yeah. You took them, and then somebody said, that's bad. See, on the on the grid, there's a, there's a grid. I'll write it down later. Good, bad, right, wrong. That's the way most of us judge things. And what we didn't know as children was that our parents were mostly always scared. They really didn't know anything about children. And so everything was either right, wrong, or good or bad. So you found out that when you, when you tried to move out somewhere, then somebody got scared. And the way in your family, when somebody got scared, some members acted angry. <laughs> you have a way of reducing things simplistically. <laughs> but isn't that the case? But to put it mildly, yes. So <laughs> when you move out, here we are, these children that are just wanting to just examine everything and take risks and so on. And then somebody gets scared and act angry. See, you can get scared and act angry. You can get scared and, and act sick. You can get scared and you can act victim. How could you do that to mother? You know how mother worries. Or what do you mean doing something like that? What are your grandmother gonna say? <clears throat> okay, so we have lots of that in our growing up. So now, there's something that you probably are already beginning to remember. You had a very skinny faculty for bringing you up. Your college for how to become human, like most of ours, was very skinny. Well, mine came, my college came from the medical background, oh, too. Oh, no, no, so no, 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 no. So that was very, don't touch, you know. And don't. No, wait a minute. No, no, you had a mother and a father. Oh, you're going back further. Than I'm that. going back to the real college. Oh, okay. <laughs> the university. Right. The university and the faculty we had. All of us had one little old skinny mother and one little old skinny father, no matter how fat they were. And those were our egg mothers and sperm fathers. Those were the beginning of the faculty, even if... We weren't brought up by them. That's where the beginning is. And you all know that first things are very important. So whatever it was about your fears of your mother, your father, how they integrated these fears, what kind of defenses they had about them, and all that, that's, that was the environment in which you grew up. And I already know from you that touching was next door to a sexual assault. <laughs> right? Similar. Yeah, sure. See, again, um, <laughs> what you, what you, what, what maybe you can become aware of, is these are the scares in your family. Your family didn't want you sexually assaulted. They didn't want you to get into trouble. They didn't want you uh, to bring unglory on them. Because you know, if you did, then that would, they would be terrible parents. And I don't know a thing about them except I know them well. <laughs> okay, so they wanted to help you be a good person. Mm -hmm. And so much is done in the interest of being good. It's like when people go to war, they say, in God we trust, kill off the enemy. And we do the same thing in the family. To be good, to make us good, we do all kinds of horrible things. Like cut down your curiosity, don't talk back to your mother, don't, um, um, don't, don't play with your body, all kinds of stuff any interest of being good. So here you are, a beautiful place where you are, which is that, hey, you know what? Maybe at this point in time, you can enroll in another university, mm -hmm. your well, own. Right. Well, I have, I think professionally, as many times I, having grown up in the medical model and then moved over to the family systems thing, I do think I want to do things naturally with with my clients, but I think, oh, I'm sure glad I'm not on tape. You know, I'm glad nobody sees this because that's not professional to get up there and hug this kid that's crying, you know, or something like that. So you're you. I said, but Virginia does it. <laughs> that's right. By so. the way, there's a case going on in Virginia right now, just next door to you, about that, and I gave some expert testimony to that about the man who touched somebody. Did you hug the judge? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've done that on the past, so and the judges are always glad if you can do it without their losing face. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you some way to, sh to do that. See, if you're with somebody like that, and you, you don't want to have them lose face, you ask them if they will participate in a demonstration <laughs> to show people what you do. When I was in Czechoslovakia, there was a... Uh, Czechoslovakia, as you know, is a communist country, and everybody, every, 
every hospital, every clinic has, quote, a um, member from the Communist Party, affectionately referred to by the people and the staff as the spies. <laughs> and so there was one of them, one of them there, and I knew it was one of them. It was later validated, and I knew that if any time that I said anything, that uh, any of those people could use against me by saying it was against the state, that everybody in this place would lose their jobs because they were they were uh, um, listening to me. So I knew I was in a vulnerable spot with this one. I was doing something with marital, the marital counselors there, and so I. Um, it, luckily, or I'm never always sure, but I didn't think he spoke any English. So I, um, you can do a lot with things like that. And I um, asked my interpreter if he would, if he would introduce me to this man and find out. And I had a nice time with him, and I could shake his hand. And I asked him if he'd be willing to demonstrate with me some things that I wanted to teach the counselors. And that got my hands on his body. And uh, it worked very well because when he left, he hugged me, and he and he wrote a very positive report. So people are always willing to help you demonstrate, but that's a different thing from saying I want to hug you. So if you ever get in a tight spot, that's what you do because the hands don't care what the contract is; they just give the feeling. And if your hands are pulsating, nice messages. It will happen. It's only when people get scared. Men, for instance, when they use their hands, sometimes they are conscious of, oh my God, I wonder if she's thinking I'm making a sexual pass. And while they're busy thinking that, that gets translated to the person and say, well, this man is making a sexual pass. <laughs> and so while you're thinking doing that, your hand gets tight. It's very interesting what happens because all this touching has to be with a free feeling for yourself. And then, of course, uh, the messages get uh, get over. Now, what do you want permission for? After all that long story, Gloria, what do you want permission for? What do you want to give yourself permission? Well, I think it's more it's more of a how relating with clients. I tend to uh, be warm and nurturing these kinds of things, and this. Uh, schooled thought says now you're going to be maternal now you're going to be sexual oh now you're going to make them dependent oh gosh this is an ego trip for you da 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 da, -da. Gee, you got a great list mm. <laughs> i have a very punitive parent that i've just kindly wheedled down the sides but she gets out of control every now and then mm -hmm. but um i more or less do it okay but i don't tell my colleagues about it you know that's why i did mom and dad too they don't i i do what i think is right Although then, back then, I knew it was wrong, but I did it anyway. But now I think it's right. I just, it feels good to be in areas like this in which it is right. And it, uh, I have a professional person that says, this is, a, this is okay, it works, it satisfies. You're not doing it for your own thing, it helps. You know, you know what, Gloria? Once upon a time, the thing that people did medically for people when they had certain kind of diseases was to put leeches on them. <laughs> and what they did is they grew leeches that were leech farms and they, they worked on the heredity of the leeches and all that. And then they would bring these leeches and they would put them all over the body. And they thought then that that was a way to heal people. I understand that George Washington died because there were too many leeches. Um, all right. And in those days, leeching was thought to be a very respectable, useful form of treatment, okay? All right. Today, if anybody hauls out leeches, I run, and so does everybody else. Leeches all over drawing your blood, okay? I think we're in a similar place about what is healing to people. What is healing? We went into the whole sterile business about where somebody wore a white coat and had a desk between and nodded. And sometimes didn't even nod. And what in the world was supposed to go on? We were supposed to have a clean, sterile atmosphere so that whatever could go on went on. And I never could figure out what was expected to go on. Now, today, we recognize something, at least there are a lot of us who do, that we are working with life, and life responds to life. It gets dead and dull when there's no life around. 
And so all the things that were associated with touching in the past as one piece, aggression, I'd like you to think about your hands and the hands, the uses that people put hands to. Hitting, pushing, um, uh, caressing, holding, all kinds of things for hands. And that touch was put into the realm of aggression and sex, except if you were under 10 months of age. <laughs> and then it was appropriate to hold people. Okay. All right. You didn't look at people either. That wasn't, you weren't supposed to do that. You were supposed to obey. Okay. So as a result, the things that are healing, which are the energies from my eyes to your eyes, from my body to your body, from my voice to your voice, allowing you to open your flower self and to see what's there. And for me to hear it and offer you whatever I can offer. I've been able to do things with my hands that could not be done in any other way. I'm very free with my hands, but my hands are also educated. They don't go where they're not wanted. They are quick to be able to make the contact, because when I touch a body, that, that body is, um, can feel what's going on here, because what I'm feeling from your arm right now, I'm touching it very lightly, you can feel it. But I also know that you, your, your body right now is a, in a holding pattern for touch. It's in a holding pattern, and that doesn't mean that I don't respect that. Because what you've just been talking about is how inside yourself, your wish to reach out and touch also is accompanied by another idea, which is that maybe you shouldn't. And so that's a readily apparent in the skin. Old time good doctors knew everything by touching. They would touch somebody and they didn't know what was going on. All right, and we can learn that. We can learn that. We can learn to have our touch, our, our voice tone, and our eye contact to be healing. Not intrusive, but healing. So at this moment in time, for you, allowing yourself to move in, and I'm going to give you a word that we'll use a lot, to your wisdom box. You know where your wisdom box is? If you stick your finger in your navel, and then you go up towards your heart, you will find a place between your navel, two inches into your navel, <laughs> and the wisdom box be halfway between your navel and your heart. Now, if you think about it, on an operating table, you will not find a thought or a feeling or an ego, neither will you find a wisdom box. But like a thought, a feeling, and an ego, your wisdom box is very real. That's the place where your truth is for you. And that's the place for most of us that it's covered over. So in your wisdom box, it's getting there where the health of yourself wants to flourish and you want to, want to allow all this beauty that you have to connect and you know it has something to do with healing. How are you feeling right now? Good. How many people are in the same spot or in generally the same track as a Gloria wanting to give yourself permission to use yourself in the interest of yourself and others for better healing purposes. Let's see. Yeah, okay, fine. Well, that feels good. I'm not alone, am I? <laughs> now something also happened. A beautiful thing just happened. Until this very minute, Gloria must have thought that she was the only one who wanted to do that. Like we as children think that the things we want or fear, and we're the only one who has that. How many of you have had that experience when you were kids? I must be the only one who ever got mad at my mother, or who ever masturbated, or I don't know what. Okay, now, already we know that when we can put things out and know that other people can connect with what we have, we already begin to feel less uh, inhibited, and more free. And you just now found out that lots of people in this group are struggling with the same thing. And that did something in your body, didn't it? Opened it up. Opened it up. All right. Now, any of you who work in groups or whenever you work, when two people can say, hey, I know about that, or three, already it's something to deal with. All right. Now we are at this moment, I think, past the time in New York 
When, oh, no, we're not New York. We're Washington. Ah, oh, sorry. New York next week. Where uh, usually people have breaks. And it's a quarter to 11 by my clock. And before I stop this for the break, I wonder how many of you in this room um, could, uh, could really feel a sense of connecting with all the people who've talked up here. Let me see. Okay. All right. Is there anyone in this room who says, oh, my God, if we're going to do that, I'm leaving? <laughs> Nobody like that. So we're more or less in the, in, the, in the avenue, in the path for what we can do. So, and it looks fine to me. So this we will begin with our design and go further as, as it turns out. So now, why don't we go further with the design? <laughs>